Uh, so in this podcast, we're going to take a look here at Second Temple Jewish uh, eschatology, or at least a, a common eschatology that would have existed uh, in the time just prior to uh, to Jesus and during the, the time of the beginning kind of the early uh, Christian movement. So we'll begin here by thinking about uh, what uh, many Jews, of course not all Jews, but for a lot of Jews, what they might have thought about in terms of the final age. So by eschatology, uh, basically this means the study of last things. So the first part of this word, eschaton, comes from a Greek word that means last. And so eschatology is the study of last things. Uh, basically the I idea of time is being uh, separated into a present age uh, and the age to come. So in this present age is marked by a rebellion and disobedience. Um, and but the idea that there would come an age in which um, the uh, the world and human society would kind of fall in line with God's will. So um, eschatology is about the study of what people think will happen uh, as this age ends and as that next age begins. So uh, it refers to and providing this kind of one definition. Um, is to the consummation of God's purpose, whether it coincides with the end of the world uh, or of history or not, uh, whether the consummation is totally final or marks a stage in the unfolding pattern of his purpose. So um, for some people's view of eschatology, uh, it's the idea that you know this world is going to end uh, and that human beings end up you know, living in some other kind of uh, dimension or there's some kind of world. Um, but for many Jews, for most Jews, uh, it's not so much about the ending of the world, but maybe ending of a particular uh, stage of history before another kind of, of history uh, will develop and that's marked by a different kind of experience. So uh, there are some problems that we have to encounter when defining Jewish eschatology. Uh, first of all, there is no uh, sy systematic description uh, of what Jews believe. So we're trying to gather an understanding basically from bits and pieces of what is claimed or what is said. So there seems, you know, what we can tell is in the literature that uh, people have ideas and we can see how some of these ideas fit into an overall um, eschatology. But we don't have anyone who has is writing, as it were, a systematic presentation of that view. There are a variety of forms uh, with different types of, of focuses. So some eschatology is very nationalistic. In other words, what will happen to the people of Israel as a nation and how it will kind of rise from the ashes and become a dominant, um, you know, productive, fruitful um, uh, nation. Some of it sees it in more economic terms, just in terms of a, a better life, more prosperity. Uh, some see it in much more kind of apocalyptic in terms of God intervening into human history in some kind of visible manifestation. Um, some see it as a religious um, eschatology in terms that this turn, as it were, to God is something that's going to occur, a kind of a revival, as it were, of people's uh, devotion, faithfulness to God. So there's lots of different focuses that exist out there. So that's partly why, again, we, we can't really talk about that being a kind of monolithic Jewish eschatology. There are a variety of views about what's, what is happening within history and what may happen in a next stage. There's also limited focuses on different elements of the final drama. So for those who think of this age is kind of coming to an end, what's going to happen uh, in the last, as it were, uh, days or the last months or the last years? What kinds of events are likely to occur? And so again, there's a limited focus on exactly what that would uh, look like. And again, it's not going to be monolithic. And there are different sources. Uh, of course, some of these sources will contradict each other. Uh, and sometimes these different sources, even with contradictory information, might even be 
combine together. So all of this uh, makes it quite difficult when we want to try and define this is what Jewish eschatology was. What we just are better off saying is here are some elements of Jewish uh, eschatology that may have been shared by a variety of different Jews. So it just needs to be nuanced quite a bit. There are some major topics in Jewish eschatology that we can at least pinpoint. Uh, there's um, you know, this concern of some type of final ordeal and a confusion that will exist before this age ends. Um, there's an expectation by many of some kind of figure named Elijah coming. And so this is because in the Old Testament, Elijah is transported uh, into the heavens. He doesn't experience death. And it's because of the book of Malachi that talks about Elijah returning before the day of the Lord. So, and we see this in the Gospels where some people think John the Baptist may be Elijah, or they may think that Jesus is Elijah. So there, are, there were Jews who were expecting either Elijah himself or the spirit of Elijah or something to uh, return in the final age uh, before the age to come arise. Uh, also, the kind of the coming of the Messiah, so uh, that some type of anointed figure by God will arrive. Uh, for many, um, it can be a single individuals. Uh, some might think of it as a human uh, figure. Some may think of it as a semi-divine figure. And, uh, or, you know, some of them will think of it as a kingly figure. Some will think of it as a military figure. But um, some uh, individual um, chosen by God is going to come just before the age to come uh, will arrive or will help to inaugurate the age to come. Uh, there will be a kind of a last assault of hostile powers. So as God is intervening, as it were, changing uh, the dynamics of the world, there will be resistance. Um, so some of these hostile powers can be celestial. So, uh, you know, beings in, a, in, this, in this heavenly world, uh, or they can be the representation of those um, demonic or hostile forces on earth. So they can be uh, powers, um, you know, governmental powers, political powers that will uh, try to resist what God is doing in the world or bringing about in the world, trying to grab power, uh, as it were, in order and try to um, suppress um, God's people in some way. Uh, there is supposed to be a renewal of Jerusalem and a renewal of the world. It's shared by many uh, expectations. So uh, Jerusalem may come under some type of attack, but Jerusalem will rise from the ashes um, because that is God's holy city. That's where the, you know, the temple exists. That's where God's name uh, dwells, where his glory dwells, and that the world itself will be kind of transformed, almost in the sense of we return back to Eden. So God started off with the plan um, and Eden, and basically everything is going to come where Eden is basically restored. Uh, and also the idea of the gathering of the dispersed. So um, we have, um, you know, Jews who have been dispersed uh, throughout history in all sorts of places. Uh, there are these people who are in exile. But the idea is that uh, when this new age comes, all those Jews will be kind of brought home. And so this big kind of homecoming uh, will, will take place and Jews will be living in the land uh, that God had promised uh, to them. Uh, and th there'll be a general resurrection. So not just the resurrection of a few individuals, uh, but all those who are righteous uh, will be raised. Uh, even for some, unrighteous will be uh, raised and then will be uh, condemned or will be punished. So uh, a general resurrection. Uh, so there'll be a last judgment. So this um, either an annihilation or some type of eternal uh, suffering uh, that will take place. Uh, there will also be eternal bliss for those who are uh, who are righteous, who are being delivered, saved, um, and damnation. You know, kind of a, a final decree of what will happen to those who have been opposing God or those who are seen as wicked who have been oppressing uh, the righteous. Some other things about the final age, we see this concept in with several different types of language. Uh, so in First Enoch, 
and the Jewish Second Temple Jewish work known as Baruch um, and Mishnah Avot. Uh, we have this concept of the world to come, so the present world, and we have this other world to come. Um, you know, part of it is human history, part of it may be kind of seen as eternal life. So the phrase world to come can take on different connotations by different authors. Uh, the final age would uh, come, and it would indicate uh, either the Messiah or kingdom was present. So when this final age has arrived, the Messiah is there, or the kingdom has arrived, or that these two would appear imminently. So in the final age, it could be that, well, the Messiah or the kingdom is not here, but it is getting ready to come. And so this may be kind of important to remember when we see language in the Gospels with Jesus and what Jesus says about the kingdom of God. So sometimes Jesus talks about the kingdom being present. Uh, in other words, it's already kind of here. Um, or, but he also sees it as something that they still wait upon. So Jesus can talk about that the kingdom of God has come upon people who uh, he heals, but he can also teach his disciples to pray, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you get a kind of this tension of both something that is supposed to be present and something it's a fuller consummation uh, will come later. For some Jews, a, a period of tribulation and a prophetic forerunner uh, would appear before the inauguration of the final age, that is the, the start of the final age. The final age uh, was compared with one of, of Israel's uh, golden periods, so a time when you had a king and a, there was a time of prosperity and a time of, of glory, uh, a time of security uh, for the people. Uh, they had this kind of identity and status, and they had their land, and they could, they could live off, uh, off their land, and they weren't being uh, oppressed uh, by foreign powers. Uh, paradise, uh, where the Messiah is, uh, is like really an Adam type of figure. Of course, this word paradise, you know, comes to, you know, Judaism basically through um, their exposure to the Persians, and so paradise has to do with a garden. Of course, there's a garden in the book of Genesis in which walk, God, you know, walks with you know, Adam and Eve, uh, and so this idea of the world being kind of rejuvenated, this final age, as it were, bringing in a kind of a paradise, and uh, the Messiah is seen as like a, a new Adam, a new beginning, a new creation is, is being started. So it's interesting when we think about this, uh, we do see some kind of Adam Christology, and in, in, uh, particularly like uh, Paul's work, he will sometimes compare uh, Jesus uh, to Adam, so that there are other Jews uh, who are thinking of the Messiah like an Adam figure. It's kind of interesting background to interpreting uh, Paul's uh, kind of Adam Christology. There's also the Exodus. So in this case, this is where the Messiah is like Moses. So many Jews think of the Messiah as delivering people out of bondage, out of, of, of captivity, uh, leading them as it were. Uh, and again, we do have kind of a Moses Christology that is at work in, in several different places in the New Testament. Most notably, we see this in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus is presented much like a Moses figure. Um, and so, um, for, for some Jews, uh, the Messiah is like a, a Moses character. Uh, there's also the Davidic reign, uh, and so this is where the Messiah is like uh, David. He he rules. So we we see Messiah kind of as the beginning of a new creation, um, the kind of the head, the father figure uh, of of a new uh, people. Messiah as a deliverer, uh, leading you know, uh, like Moses does, challenge the the powers, uh, and then is able to with you know divine help is able to get the powers to relinquish control and uh, lead the people out, uh, whereas the Messiah, like David, is one who is, sits upon a throne and you know, oversees, as it were, the administration, the governance uh, of the people. So in terms of kind of sequencing of the final age, again, this is a bit sketchy because you're gathering from different you know, uh, material. Uh, but if you're uh, doing that and realizing that 
you know, maybe no single author has all of this sequence completely in mind, but that co kind of collectively they have aspects of it. Uh, there is going to be some kind of antichrist uh, that leads heathen powers, um, but this antichrist is going to be defeated. So some figure there who stands opposed, who, who was not chosen by God, um, and in, in fact is a person who stands opposed to God, and uh, these heathen powers, you know, non-Israelite powers, non-Jewish powers, um, are going to attempt to exert control in the world, but they are going to be defeated. Uh, either God or the Messiah would lead the forces that are going to uh, defeat the Antichrist. So sometimes this is seen in kind of militaristic uh, terms, uh, where there is an actual war fight that will take place, and sometimes it is seen as a kind of cosmic celestial uh, deliverance, where they're basically wiped out, much like you know the Egyptians can be wiped out in one single blow. Um, crossing the, the Red Sea, so too God can just simply wipe out the uh, uh, forces that are opposed against him. A judgment by God or Messiah follows uh, God's victory over evil, so uh, those who, were, who uh, were not a part of those heathen powers uh, still stand under God's judgment. Uh, they may not have been engaged in violent opposition against God's people, but nor have they been individuals who have uh, submitted to God's authority. Instead, they may have submitted to um, follow uh, other gods. So they, they have to be judged, and uh, the Messiah as well may be involved in that judgment in some, uh, some aspects. Uh, the oppressors of Israel then are punished in some ways. Um, they either can be, you know, terminate, um, Know, terminate it, uh, they don't exist anymore, uh, or they may in, uh, come to have to serve Israel. The Messianic kingdom uh, is then set up in Israel, um, and it's going to have a purified and greater Jerusalem and temple. So it's very much kind of like what happens with the Hasmoneans who you know, regain control over Jerusalem under Antiochus Epiphanes, and they have to cleanse the temple because it had been used for a foreign uh, god, so now the Messiah it comes into Jerusalem and purifies Jerusalem, purifies the temple, rededicates it, as it were, uh, to God, because there's mm, Jerusalem, in a sense, hasn't been this uh, glory of God, hasn't, its leadership has not stayed true to, um, uh, to following God, and therefore it needs to be purified so that it cleansed so that it'll be uh, righteous and will continue to serve God as God intends. The, the Messiah uh, reigns then over the entire world, uh, so not just over, um, he didn't have authority just over little Israel, but uh, you know, he has authority over the whole world. Uh, and he gathers together the dispersed uh, of Israel, so all those who have been in exile come back to the land. Uh, the righteous are, are resurrected, uh, and so they too get to enjoy uh, the benefits of this uh, you know, new kingdom and this new world uh, that is in compliance with, with God's will. Uh, I think I'll end here with uh, looking at the, the Messianic kingdom. The question sometimes raised, would this Messianic kingdom be eternal? Uh, some did argue that it would be eternal. There would be no end to this kingdom. So... Um, you know, like First Enoch and the Sibylline Oracles and the Psalms of Solomon, uh, think of it in that way. Uh, but some said no. Uh, so Second Baruch and Second uh, Ezra, uh, Jubilees, uh, and in uh, Mishnah uh, Sanhedrin, uh, they don't think of it as as being eternal. So that's a different uh, view of the of the kingdom as opposed to others. Uh, then you know if it's not going to be eternal, of course the question becomes, then when does a final judgment come? So that's not very very clear. Sometimes people think of it coming before the Messianic kingdom, so like in First Enoch or in the Enoch tradition or in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, uh, see is judgment coming before that kingdom starts, and then some see it at the end of this kingdom. So again, even within Enoch traditions, the Enoch traditions have contradictory ideas within the same book, 
um, but you know, maybe coming from different hands or different authors. Um, but Second Baruch, uh, Second Ezra, so um, these other uh, works think of judgment coming at the end of a messianic kingdom. So uh, for th some people's eschatology, the messianic kingdom is kind of temporary before another kingdom uh, will arrive. And, but for others, the Messianic kingdom is the, the final kingdom. All right, we'll stop here then with uh, this kind of look at generally some of the uh, Jewish eschatology uh, that existed uh, prior to the beginning of, of Christianity and, and right through even during the time that Christianity is developing and growing.